Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, as we continue our journey through the book of, um, uh, book of 1 Peter, um, it's a long passage that I want to share with you today, and I'd like to explain why, because we're going to be looking at the second half of chapter 1, which deals with the, the issue of being confident in our salvation, and it is connected to the previous passages where uh, Peter talked to us about uh, the role that suffering plays and how God uses suffering to build confidence in our lives because we've seen him work in our lives through difficult circumstances. And so it's the continuation of one thought. And you can see evidence of that simply in the ways that our Bibles, or at least my Bible, the translation I'm reading from, the New American Standard, translate the passage because it's, uh, the, it's almost big, long sentences. You know, the English teachers told me when I wrote my papers not to do that, not to make it all one capital letter at the beginning and one period at the end. Um, but the reason it's done that way is because it's a continuous thought. So it is a long passage, but if you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me and let's hear the reading of God's Word to help us have confidence in our salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 3, even though verses 10 is the focus of our message for today. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercies has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. And through, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in, into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Don't be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who has called you, be yourselves also holy in all of your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I'm holy. And if you address the Father uh, as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who though uh, through who, th him, th who th are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And since you've been obedient to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, and the seed of that which is perishable, not which seed with that which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for just the joy of worship today. Thank you for your presence in this place. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would now help me to keep focused on you and help us to keep focused on your word so that we might truly not only in understand the implications of salvation, but maybe somebody today would come to the place where they'd trust you for salvation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. You could be seated. You know, Peter reminds those early Christians scattered across Asia Minor that they were basically pilgrims or, or, or foreigners, um, but they were preferred by God and they, they were protected by him and they, they had a living hope that's in, an invaluable inheritance and a precious faith that they would see come to its fruition in the day of Christ's appearing. And to, so to summarize the first major section, verses 3 and following, uh, Peter calls on his um, readers to rejoice in the present sufferings uh, because of their hope, their faith, their love. Um, they had certain hope in the future appearing of Jesus Christ and their final glorification. They had faith in God's dealings with them, namely that even though he allowed them to go undergo trials, the love for Christ that they had and for the work that he had already done in them would sustain them and would keep them in the future. So it may be that looking forward, looking around us and looking back, we find confidence in Jesus Christ if we have truly trusted him. Salvation is the subject of chapter 1, verse 3, all the way through chapter 2, verse 10. The recurrence of the word salvation in verses uh, chapter 1, verse 5, verse 9, and verse 10, and in chapter 2, verse 2, he re keeps referring to the salvation that we've got, the, the salvation that we've received, the salvation that we trust, the salvation that we're confident in. You know, I've shared this story on many occasions, so forgive me for sharing it again, but I remember when I was a young pastor, pastoring in the, uh, a little small country church in the tobacco fields of North Carolina, uh, they were wonderful people, uh, truly wonderful people loved the Lord, but if I said to you they were a little more liberal in their theology than I am, would that tell you something? All right, so they were a little more liberal in their theology, not quite as, not quite as, not quite as literal as I may take the Bible in certain places, all right? And um, one of the habits that I have is I believe that the Word of God always calls for a decision. And so I would share the plan of salvation and call for salvation opportunities at every single service. And one of those dear, wonderful folks came to me and said, Preacher, you preach on getting saved every single Sunday. Isn't there more? Isn't there more? And the answer was, well, yes, there is more. But if you've not been saved, if salvation has not been your experience, nothing more matters. Nothing more will help. If you don't have salvation nailed down, there's nothing more except hurt, heartache, loneliness, death, and hell for all of eternity. And so I share that with you simply to say, I hope that I'm reflecting Peter's perspective here. He keeps bringing up the topic of your salvation so that you and I can have confidence in it. Uh, the main thread of Peter's conversation here is expressed in one sentence. Then you will rejoice with inexpressible joy, glorious delight, when each of you receive the outcome of your faith your salvation. So the significance of our salvation, now he says, is evidenced by our changed lives. The evidence of salvation should be reflected in the change of our lives. I, I, as, a, as a follower of Jesus Christ who's been born again, if I continue to live like the same old Mike that I was before I got saved, it begs the question of whether I got saved or not. Because when I got saved, the old me was buried with Christ. The, the new Mike is resurrected with Jesus Christ, forgiven of his sin, and now should live a life that looks like the resurrected Savior, even if it's not perfect. And the significance of our salvation is evidenced by the changed lives. And unfortunately, as a culture, and even as a culture of churches around the, uh, around the country, we don't seem to be doing so well. Now, I'm going to share some statistics with you, and I'm sorry that I don't have them on the screen for you. It's hard to see numbers in the air. So I'm not, going to, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of numbers, but I want you to know it is still true that most researchers who study faith and Christian and church in America say, still say that the majority of Christians, or excuse me, the majority of Americans say that religion is very important. And the majority say that they believe in God. However, their patterns of behavior don't necessarily reflect that. The attitudes 
And the actions of many Christians is, is virtually statistically no different than non-Christians. And the most glaring example, the easiest one to find, if you go Google it, the easiest one to find is going to be the divorce rate in America, that the divorce rate in, the, in the, 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 those who claim faith in Jesus Christ, the divorce rate is about the same as the rest of the world. Now that's not to, uh, please, I'm not, we're not talking about divorce today, so don't feel anything negative about that, except it's just a reality that exists. There are other things that indicate that we're not doing so well in allowing God to reshape our lives and our perspectives based on our salvation. Um, Christian Post and other, uh, other places have cited some research that say a church attendance has changed. Now, we cannot blame all of this church attendance change on COVID because the trends had already begun prior to 2020 and the COVID experience. And one of those is seven out of 10 people who consider themselves church members um, are also changing what it means to necessarily be a church member. One example is our culture now considers one time a month a regular attender for church. If you attend church one time a month, you're considered to be a regular attender. Good news for some of you, all right? Y'all can smile and nod. It's okay, all right? But according to some uh, LifeWay research, in 2019, 34% of Americans attended religious services at least once or twice a month. That number in 2021 has fallen to 28%. We don't have the numbers for 2022 yet, but friends, we can't blame that on COVID because it had already decreased from um, 40% to 36% to 34%, now 28%. How do you explain that? You know, we're, we're called to live lives that reflect our salvation. Because we so revere the holiness of God, we don't think we can attain it and it appears that many people don't even try. The question Peter throws at us is, how confident are you in your salvation? Our salvation should cause us to live lives that evidence a holiness. And because we can't be holy and we freely admit it, have we tried to reflect the holiness of God in our lives? So the first thing Peter points out to me is, first of all, it's the, simply the past declaration of our salvation. This is not something new. This is something that has been testified to by the prophets according to verse 10. First of all, testified by the prophets. He reminds us that um, the prophets had predicted and written about the Messiah, Jesus Christ's life as, as their own, even if they did not fully understand the who, the what, the when, the where, or the how. The Old Testament prophets predicted that the Messiah would experience both suffering and glory. Uh, in passages like Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. However, they didn't understand how his suffering and glory would fit together, and probably neither do we. It's possible to understand that the mystery only revealed itself to us after we saw his sufferings. Remember, Peter, as, an, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, knew his knew his Jewish heritage, and, and so he, he had been brought up in the rabbinic schools, and so he knew what the prophets had said about the coming of the Messiah, and then Jesus appears. Were they skeptical? I don't know, but what we do know is at least 12 of these disciples were so confident that they had been with the Messiah, they were willing to give their lives for it, and are we? It simply reminds us that even though they did not fully comprehend what they were communicating, they were faithful to share that the Word of God was going to come to fruition. They might not be able to verbalize all the details, but they, even if they didn't understand, they knew that God would honor His Word. And if you'll notice why they did it, they did it not necessarily for themselves. The passage says they did it as a ministry for us. They, they were doing it for us. Uh, the prophets prophesied the grace that would come, made careful searches, seeking to know what person, what time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, and he predicted the, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow revealed to them so that they were not serving themselves, but you. Uh, listen, am I the only parent who ever said to their children when it came time for a spanking, this is going to hurt me 
a whole lot more than it's going to hurt you. Am I the only one who ever said that? No, of course not. Did you also say to them that, that you said, maybe you prefaced it and said, listen, someday you're going to understand that I'm not doing this just to be hurtful to you. I'm doing it for your good. Uh, uh, you know, you're grounded for a month. Now, I don't know if any of y'all know what being grounded means. Do we still do that? We did back in the day. It didn't work, but we did it. My mother would say, all right, you're grounded for a month. That means you can't leave the house. You can't go outside and play with your friends. You can't do this. You can't do that. Well, and I'm doing this. Someday you're going to thank me for doing this. And I said, yeah, right. Number one, I wasn't staying in the house. Number two, there's no way I could understand how that's going to benefit me. Now that I'm 60 years old, guess what I have learned? I now know why and how those lessons, if I'd have paid attention to them, would have benefited me. If I'd have only listened, if I'd only followed her advice, some of the stuff that I could have missed, she did it for future growth, future understanding, future protection, and future love. That's what the prophets have done for us. He says the prophets have given to you a promise, even if I don't fully know what that means or what that, how that was going to look, I prophesied. They did it based on the Spirit of God within the Spirit of Christ within them. They didn't do it of their own accord. They were moved by the Spirit of God to prophesy and tell us that, that salvation is going to come to those who accept the Messiah. So it's testified by the prophets, but it's also interesting that Peter says it's also going to be longed for by the angels. One, pa uh, one translation says regarded by the angels to take notice, to look at concerning this salvation. The prophesies prophesied about the grace that was going to be ours. And they searched carefully and diligently inquiring about all the details, even if they did not fully understand it because their salvation was rooted in their faith. They, as Abraham was, Abraham believed God, the Bible says, believed God, it was reckoned unto him righteousness. See, they didn't have the Messiah yet to take away their sins. They had an Old Testament sacrificial system that God would use to justify them, to clean them, and to make them safe and secure in his presence that was by their faith. But they didn't, they didn't have the blessing that you and I have. And here he says the images of angels looking into these issues of salvation as well. Looking in, longing to understand those things. In essence, these angels are maybe peering over a balcony, looking over into the arena of salvation. See, not only did the prophet serve us by foretelling the coming of the Messiah, the angels also serve us. In Hebrews 1.14, there, are there not ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of all of those who inherit salvation? And we always interpret that as the possibility that angels, the Bible says that we've been attended by angels unaware. We didn't even know that God had sent someone to watch over us. Remarkable then in the, in the Bible when an angel appeared to Mary. you got to know that was a radical experience. Right? Shepherds sitting out in a, a field doing their job, and an angel appears, and then a multitude of angels appears. Would it change your perspective if an angel showed up right now? Mmm. I'll tell you why I say that. In Revelation, um, I believe in Revelation uh, you know, chapter 1, he talks about the seven churches of Revelation. And he saw, uh, John saw the curtain pull back, and he saw seven lampstands, which are the churches. And in the midst of the lampstands, he saw Jesus. And in the lampstands, or in the, in the presence of Jesus, there were seven angels. Y'all know what those were? Those were, that's a reference to the pastors of those churches that those seven candlesticks or those candlesticks represent. I'm not suggesting I'm an angel. That's why I said, mm, I don't, how am I going to explain this? I am not suggesting that I'm an angel. I'm simply suggesting that God uses messengers to proclaim to us the declaration of our salvation. Aren't you thankful somebody preached it to you? Aren't you thankful that you heard it somewhere along the way? If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your answer to that question has to be, I'm thankful I heard it, but what am I supposed to do about it? Well, today you can repent of your sin, trust Jesus Christ, and be born again. And you can have the gift of salvation. Peter says there's a declaration of our salvation testified by the prophets, 
and longed for by angels. Angels don't experience salvation because they don't need it because their souls are not sinful like ours, but they long for the understanding of the fullness of the glory of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Number two, Peter hints at the salvation has an effect on our lives. Now listen, i got to go real fast through this section, all right, because as a result of our salvation, there should be a change in the lives that we lead. And he says, therefore, there's some actions that we should take as a result of our salvation. First of all, he says, you and I should be prepared. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, is what he later says. He literally says, you should prepare your minds for action. Gird up the loins of your mind is what I believe the King James says. Now, that might be strange to us, but it's a reference to girding up the loins of your mind is a reference to um, in uh, Old Testament or even in Jesus' day because of the robes. Whenever they got ready to do something of significance, the robes would cause them to trip and they fall. So they would take their robes, wrap them and gather them up, pull them up through their legs and be, basically create uh, pants legs so that they could move and do what they want to do. And so Peter is suggesting to them, in other words, get ready for some action to take place. Be prepared mentally for what God is going to do in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for the master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and when he knocks. In other words, prepare, be prepared for for not only they're talking, he's thinking about be prepared for the revelation of Jesus Christ, for him to make his appearance. But he's also suggesting that because of salvation's effect on our lives, we should put forth some effort. We should be prepared for what God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives. He goes on to say not only should we be prepared for God to work, we should also be controlled, self-controlled, be sober in spirit. Now, Peter's not so much talking here about being sober from alcohol, even though that is the analogy that is presented for us. The idea here is to make sure that you pay attention and that you keep your faculties fully operational. And when you're, when you're not sober, your judgment is impaired. You can't think clearly. You're slow to react. Sometimes your reactions are not consistent with your personality or the way you would ordinarily act, and it results often in fatal situations. Peter is telling us to stay alert for, be prepared for God to work, and you do that by blocking out all those things that are going to keep you from the Lord. You Be sober-minded, pay attention, don't let anything muddle your thinking, don't let Satan whisper in your ear, don't let some preacher convince you of anything other than the truth of God's holy word. You and I have to, we have to be self-controlled. Now, that's a, hard, that's a hard lesson for a culture like ours because the culture around us says anything goes. It, it, if it feels good, what? That's what the culture says. And why does the culture say that? Because our sin nature says that. Without the gift of salvation, we ourselves would say it's okay. Do whatever, do whatever it feels good. A saved person is going to be more self-controlled than that. Listen, I, I don't have time to share a bunch of illustrations with you, but, but I've shared with you before a church member who said to me one time, uh, Preacher, I do anything I want to do, don't you? And my answer is, no, ma'am. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I can't do whatever I want to do. My, I, my flesh may want to, but as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have control. I have, to, I, have to, I have to work at doing that. And it's the Spirit of God that enables me to do it in the first place. Without Him... I'd give in. He says, no, third, to, to be hopeful and expectant. All this is in verse 13. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, you're to have your mind prepared for action, and you're to be fully sober-minded so that you set your hope on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be hopeful and expectant. I am doing this not to impress you. I am doing this not to earn your favor. I am doing this because I anticipate seeing Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord, and I want to be able to stand in His presence presence with him receiving honor and glory from my life. You know why? Because he bought it. He purchased it. My life 
is, Paul says, my life is hidden in Christ. And so we're called to be hopeful and expectant. I had great news for you. Peter is fully expecting to see Jesus any minute because he remembered when Jesus was told, they were, they were told by the angels, this same Jesus that you have seen go will come again in the same manner. And they're fully expecting to see him at any minute. Now, friends, I'm going to be honest with you. We live in a church culture where we talk about it all the time. I'll be ready for, I'm, I'm ready for Jesus to come. I can't wait to see him. I'll be glad. Oh, I'm longing to see Jesus. My question is, are you really? Does your life indicate that you're ready to see Jesus? I'm going to tell you, when I was growing up on the Mill Village, we got on the bus to go to a Sunday afternoon. Oh, Jimmy Harris and others would say to us, now y'all remember who you are. Y'all remember who you are. Because when I see you again, you're going to have to answer for what you did. Friends, when we see Jesus, we're going to have to answer. And there's some things I don't want Jesus to know. Am I the only one? There's some things I don't want Jesus. If he came back today, I don't want him to catch me talking like that. If he came back today, I don't want him to catch me over there. If he came back today, I don't want him to catch me watching that or listening to that. If he came back today, would my life reflect his glory. You and I should be confident in our salvation because we can be hopeful and expectant. He tells us to be obedient. In verses 14 and 15, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lust, which was yours in your ignorance. Be holy as I am holy. The word it starts as, starts this section, as obedient children. Because of who we are in Christ and what we've been given, we ought to live accordingly and be obedient children. In the past, we didn't know any better. Friends, if you have heard the Bible presentation of the gospel, then you're now responsible for what you heard. You can, the ignorance is now gone. There's no excuse for sinfulness because we have been changed because we've been born again we have become a new creature and we now have and we desire to have the mind of Christ in us so we shouldn't be conformed to our former passions that were ours in our sinfulness we should now long for the things that make us holy and I what some people think because some people think well I can watch this TV show and it's not going to really be it's not going to bother me is that true what kind of subliminal messages do I get from the media all day, every day? And the problem is, they know it. They know it. They put that stuff in there sometimes on purpose to get you to buy their product or use their lotion or buy their smell good or whatever it is. They do it on purpose. Can I suggest to you, friends, it's got to be more than that. You and I need to be prepared for the work of God. We need to be sober-minded. We need to be serious about how God is working in our lives. If we do that, we can be hopeful and expectant, knowing that if he came at any moment. What if, what if he came right now? Wouldn't it be wonderful? If he came right now and, fought, count, and found us all here? Uh, that should have been an amen right there. I don't know what y'all are thinking. It, I, I, I am not the first preacher who ever said, listen, I'm 60 years old. If I drop dead of a heart attack in the next five minutes, all right, good news for you. Don't weep for me. Now, somebody try, okay? Somebody do some CPR or something just to give it a, just to give it a, you know, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go, but let's make sure it's my time to go, okay? <laughs> but if something happens to me, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm like every other, I like other preachers. I'm looking forward to heaven as much as the next guy, but I kind of like it here too right right but if christ came to today we could be hopeful and expectant we should anticipate his coming and we prove that by being obedient and the holiness of our lives that's part number three and i'm going to fly through this one just as fast as i flew through the last one okay the salvation salvation's mark on us is the mark of holiness the word holy simply means set apart, unique, distinctly different than everything else around us. Later on in his book, Peter tells them about this new identity that they have in 1 Peter chapter 2, one of my favorite passages. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a people of his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have. My mind rushes back to my youth days. We had a musical that we sang, and this was the text of one of those songs. And you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. It was a big, it was a big thing. You're impressed, aren't you? <laughs> That left a mark on my mind. And you know when I remember it? When I read a passage about holiness. And I remember that if I'm going to claim the name of Jesus Christ, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be bold enough to say that I've been saved, I've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ to a new and living hope, then I better act like it. That is Holiness. He's saying that people who have been set apart. Why? Why holiness? Because number one, it proclaims the excellency of God, and it shows how powerful and glorious God is. We're to live lives of holiness. And he tells us that we're to live lives, we're to be holy, first of all, because of a reverent fear of God. He says, as you are holy, as a, let, me find, let me find my place. Verse 17. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time of life on earth. Fear, it means reverent fear of God. Holiness means that we have such a relationship with God, such a relationship through the salvation of Jesus Christ, that we conduct ourselves with reverence and fear before him. Please be careful. This is not a how-you-do-church conversation. This is not saying you're supposed to be quiet and reverent. Sometimes you are. Be still, the psalmist said, and know that I'm God. Sometimes fear manifests itself as quiet and reverent. And sometimes acknowledgement and reverence of God means shouting it from the rooftops. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. So it's about reverencing God. The command was equally addressed to the first children of Israel, but it applies to Christian today because we are the people of God. Peter is quoting from Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44. God says, uh, for I am the Lord your God. You therefore shall sanctify yourselves and be ye holy for I am holy. If we're going to reflect God in us, then we reflect holy. So listen, I read one little boy getting ready to go to Sunday school with his dad one day, and as they were getting ready to go, the boy said, Dad, did you go to Sunday school when you were a little boy? He said, well, I sure did. He said, well, then why am I going? It ain't going to do me any good either. <laughs> why does the world want to follow a Christ that his own people won't follow? We're called to lives of holiness. And he tells us, first of all, not only because of a reverent fear of God, but he says, be holy because you've been redeemed, because you have been born again, beginning in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable, but with things like silver and gold. Things, these are examples of things that are perishable, but instead with the precious blood as a lamb, unblemished and spotless, and then he identifies the Messiah for us. He identifies the Savior for us. Jesus Christ. Redemption is defined as buying back from bondage by the payment of a price. You know, uh, when we hear the word redemption, you, we automatically think of theological concepts. In Peter's day, when they, there were millions of slaves in the Roman Empire. Some were born slaves. Some were made slaves when Rome took over their, their land or their kingdom. And so they became slaves. Redemption was what all slaves were looking for. Someone to come and pay the necessary price to set them free. Jesus Christ, his shed blood has paid the price to set us free. Verses 18 and 19, the, not only, the, not only the, um, because we're redeemed, but the price of our redemption is seen. With precious blood as a lamb, unblemished and spotless. In the past, God's people offered animal sacrifices for their sin. Year after year, time after time. Hebrews 10, 4 said, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away the sin. The price of your redemption, the price of being set free. Because see, we're all born slaves to sin. 
Every person born has a sin nature that is part of our heritage from Adam and Eve all the way down to us. We're slaves to sin. There's a part of me that says, I, I'm old enough, I just remember Flip Wilson. Anybody remember him? Do anybody, does anybody young know who Flip Wilson is? Google it, all right? You'll know what I mean. Flip Wilson made a career out of dressing up in drag and saying what, older folks? The devil made me do it. The devil never made you do anything, ever. The devil has never made you do anything. He has tempted you, and in your sin nature, you said, okay. Can I tell you something else? God has never made you do anything either. He has simply said, trust me. Ask for forgiveness and you will receive it. So he has paid the price for redemption. The process is, verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times. I love this part, for the sake of you, consistent with the prophet's message for you. Through, and through him are believers in God who has raised him from the dead and given him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Real quickly, that part of that passage who raised him from the dead is the core element of salvation that Paul refers to in 2 Corinthians when he said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That God has raised him from the dead. He goes on to tell us of the permanence of our salvation in the passage, he tells us that you've been born again, not of that which will fade or will perish, but that which is imperishable. And though it is, what is imperishable? The imperishable is the living and enduring Word of God. What God has said, God has said. It, it will not fade with time. It will not change in substance. Um, I have in my office a collection of Bibles. I have in my Bible, uh, excuse me, in my office a Bible. I believe it's 170 years old. 170 years old. It, it's, it's in a, it's in a, it's in a, like a Ziploc bag that has had the air sucked out of it because over time it'll turn to dust. The bag is full of dust in the bottom. If I open it up and handled it, you know what would happen to it? It'll slowly disintegrate right before your very eyes. On the rare occasion I have looked in it, the words have faded and they're hard to see. Friends, this book may get old. In fact, it's already starting to come apart right here. Might have bit some duct tape on that. This may fall apart and it may get old. And um, In fact, it's kind of getting hard to read. The Word of God will never change. It will never fail. It will never fade. And he tells us that. He quotes from the Old Testament when he says, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. Nothing lasts forever. But what? The Word of God endures forever. It is the permanence of of our salvation. And the last phrase of this passage says, and this is the word which was preached to you. What is he talking about? He's talking about the message of salvation that you and I can know that it's been declared for us. Prophets and angels have declared for us the message of God. You and I can be confident in the evidence of salvation when people see holiness. And what does holiness look like? Oh, it's being prepared. It's staying serious-minded and focused and not, not, getting, not getting drunk with the world, but being focused on Him. It, it's living with expectation. It's having confidence in the, in the redemption that we have. The world will see it, and we'll remember it. Salvation can be yours today. I am fully aware that most of us would say, that we've been born again. Most of us in this room would say that we're saved, that we're Christians, and that we're, we've experienced the gift of salvation. Two reminders from Peter. Are you proving it? Because you truly believe it. Today, you can be confident in your salvation. If there's a single person here 
who would answer the question and say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I, I think I am. I hope I am. I, I act like I am, but I'm not really sure. Why don't you make sure today? Don't worry about being baptized back there. Don't worry about joining that church back there today. Let your confidence in your salvation begin today. And, and if there's someone who's here who has never trusted Jesus Christ and truly been born again, you have truly said, Lord, I need you. I got nothing else. I'm sinful and I know it and now I'm caught in it. Would you please forgive me? Come into my heart. Save me. Rescue me. Redeem me. Set me free from my own self, my sin. Would you trust him today? And would you trust us? To let, let's pray with you. This is the word that's been preached to you.